Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Oh man, we got some big news. The banks are looking super weak. The new financial system is looking super strong. I mean, it does get better than this, but I like to say that it doesn't get any better than this. On days like today, this article is from FT.com, FinancialTimes.com. These are the type of articles we got to look out for. This article, I'm trying not to lose my spot here. This article is titled, Why Are U.S. Banks Hoarding Liquidity? Holding on to liquidity. This is something we've talked about time and time again. Now, I'm going to let them tell you. We have them right where we want them. When this new financial system pops off, if it does, not financial advice, I'm not a financial advisor, but it's going to be explosive. You pair that with the flood of liquidity that's going to come from all these big companies and Wall Street players and everybody else looking for an alternative to banks. And we're looking at possibly the biggest bull run of all time at some point in the future. I don't know when. I don't know. I just know that given all the proper catalysts, holy smokes, there's something major coming. If it all plays out the way that I'm seeing it, of course, I could be wrong, but let's go back to this article here. All right. It says the persistence of banks reserve levels were first presented to us as a as a sign that the Federal Reserve has plenty of time before it needs to stop shrinking its balance sheet. But now that we think of it, this is Financial Times talking. But now that we think of it, isn't it kind of strange for banks to hang on to reserves while the Federal Reserve is steadily reducing the size of its bond portfolio? Wait a minute. Now, Financial Times, I got to wag my finger at you. Shame on you. I mean, unless I'm completely wrong, you people let me know. But how is it strange that they're holding on to that, hoarding liquidity, if we know that a good amount of banks have since the time of the collapse of those banks back in uh, May, right, they have been utilizing the emergency federal fund to this day. It's just that the mainstream keeps it quiet. They have been hurting for quite some time. They continue to borrow from the emergency fund. So then why would it be strange? And I'm not claiming that the banks are doing this that are doing this are the ones who are doing that. But there is no differentiation that Financial Times has set in specifying which banks here as opposed to those who have done that. They don't provide any clarity. They just sort of gloss over it. So I'm, I'm left to make my own deductive reason, reason, utilize my own deductive reasoning. Right. But if they're continuing to borrow from that fund, why would they also not hoard liquidity? We know. And you just said it yourself that reserves have been flat. Liquidity has been flat for them. Tell me that everybody and their mother, <laughs> this is what people used to say back in the day, hasn't been looking for somewhere else to park their money. Somewhere else. Mostly they're battling what? Money market funds. And that's considering, that's not even taking into account the people that are sitting on cash on the side or the people that are going into gold and silver or other things. People are looking for everywhere to park their money except the banks because they don't like the banks anymore. They don't trust the banks. That plays right into our hands. And this is why so many big companies are so bullish on the new financial system. If you're paying attention, you're seeing this. It's right there for you. Let's keep going here. It says, Quantitative tightening is supposed to be a mechanical process. When the Fed bought bonds, it created reserves. So it should. So shouldn't it destroy reserves when it reduces its bond holdings? That would be reasonable and rational and logical. Right. But at the same time, there's no rules right now. They're doing whatever they can to keep everything afloat. They're doing what's necessary to keep their limping system from bleeding out, for lack of a better word. And I've been saying that for a long time as well. All right. If you disagree, you can disagree. I can respect your opinion. It says, but that's what I'm saying. Seeing it says that hasn't happened. Instead, the liquidity is coming out of the Fed's Reserve Repo Facility or RRP. Where money market funds stash money overnight. Oh, you wanted to mention the money market. OK, OK. The problem is that it's expensive for banks to hoard cash today. Uh oh. As Bank of America rate strategist Mark Cabana argues, quote, banks are bidding up for liquidity, bidding up for liquidity. Why? 
if liquidity is not is not a problem, why would they have to bid up for liquidity? There's a liquidity problem. We have a liquidity solution. We have a liquidity solution. <laughs> I don't know about you. I'm sitting on a ton of it. I can't wait. I can't wait when it pops off each in its own time. It says here to draw. I knew that they had to address it. They had to to draw depositors away from money market funds. This is not the only article that talks about this article after article after article. They're talking about people running to other places to park their money to draw. And that's not going to happen. They're not drawing anybody anywhere. Not from not in my humble opinion. They're not to draw is, is a lot more. Let's keep going to draw depositors away from money market funds. Banks are offering higher yielding cash products. It's not all about yield. Although yield is good and we all want to make money. OK, but sometimes you sour a relationship so much that it's not about yield anymore. It's about trust and yield. I want to make money, but I also want to trust the institutions I'm dealing with. Says, but wait, let me stop. So I want to read this a little bit from the Bank of International Settlements because it's very important about hoarding liquidity. Now, this is a little tip that they put out here, and it says this. Keep this in mind as we go into the future. It says, concerned about the size and location of the exposure to subprime related assets, banks stop lending to other banks that we know. It says, it says, and decided to hoard liquidity buffers in response to several factors. Widespread concerns about the solvency of their counterparts in interbank operations. So that gives you one look into why banks would hoard liquidity. They hoard liquidity. Let's just extract the essence from that statement. They hoard liquidity when they are concerned about the health of the overall financial system. So here, widespread concerns about the solvency of their counterparts in interbank operations. We have uh, assets that specialize in interbank payments. Uh, we have we have so many solutions, so many. Boom. Now, wait, OK, let's move on from there. I'm going to get to a little bit more of this news. We're cooking today. I feel good. I hope you all feel good out there. Appreciate you being here as always. Now, this little tidbit here from this article titled XRP now brace for a huge multi trillion Wall Street earthquake. We've heard that before. We've heard other people say that before. We've read other articles about that before. But this it says this forty eight point three trillion dollars flooding into not only XRP, but also Bitcoins on the table as well. Ethereum will be on the table as well. and Other legit products. I mean, pro projects. It says per this disclosure, the, the this crypto surge is expected to occur upon the approval of the much awaited Bitcoin spot exchange traded fund. Farley, uh, someone named Farley remarked concerning the Bitcoin ETF, M quote, money will flood into the industry with a Bitcoin ETF. Here's the thing. If a lot of those banks in the future, we have more bank collapses and we've seen a number of concerning activities, especially with everything getting hacked as of late. Oh, my word has been absolutely disgusting. You have tokenization of everything. You have interbank payments. You have retail payments. Um, and this goes for Stellar, Algorand, as well as XRP. You have that Wall Street money. You have people that may want to park their money somewhere else. And they're probably they may not necessarily want to go with something like Bitcoin. I think we're going to have a lot more specialized offerings for XRP and XRPL. This is why you look at the explosion of ETP exchange traded pro uh, 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 products that are exploding in a, a variety of different places around the world. I mean, there I mean, there is a golden age coming for crypto. From, from what I can see. And there's only a handful of crypto that are going to benefit. They have to be extremely legit and competitive uh, 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 products. But we're looking at the bank coins. Uh, you know the usual suspects. Then you have the, the utility coins like VChain. Uh, I, I can't even consider Chainlink just an outright utility coin anymore. They're pretty much a bank coin with the with the uh, partnerships that they've been working with. Um, I look at Solana the same way. They're creeping into our territory at this point. I, I can't even say our territory because I'm I'm holding a little bag of those just so I can, you know, one bag you take profit and I have a little bag so I can make some, some capital off of there and they've been looking good as of now. Um, so, you know, 
there is there's a lot of capital coming in whatever this golden age is going to be. It's not going to be one coin. I would never say that some coins are going to win more than others. That's up to you to decide for yourself which ones you think are going to win the most uh, or which ones are best for you. You got to make up your own mind about that. But it w there will not be one coin that is winner. There will be multiple coins that are winners, just like in that last bull run. Multiple coins were winners. Um, one that I think is getting slept on a lot that um, I've been attempting to cover every every time there's something significant that comes out about it. I think quant is going to go rocket ship. I do. And it's a good thing that people are getting bored with quant and leaving quant. There's going to bring a little bit more uh, stability and I, mean, I won't even say stability, forget stability, but it makes it more delicious for those companies to step in because quant is really for um, the large institutions, banks. That's what they focus on. They don't even focus on retail. They don't even try. Um, and so that leaves a heck of a lot of explosiveness in quant. I love quant. Um, so anyway, I just throwing that out there. Let's move on to some other news here. I'm going to get to a little bit of this stellar related news. People have to, well, they don't have to, but I think it's interesting to connect the dots here. This article is titled BlackRock likely to boost Coinbase stake. This is something that um, I think we discussed some time ago that BlackRock might potentially get more involved with Coinbase. Now, here's my connection. Coinbase. I said this a long time ago. Coinbase. Well, BlackRock. Coinbase. Coinbase. Circle. Circle. Stellar. Now, so too far to go out on a limb and say if Stellar can work with the United Nations, if Stellar can work with the World Economic Forum, if Stellar can work with the White House, if Stellar can work with Franklin Templeton, if Stellar can work with Wisdom Tree, that there might be a little possibility that Stellar could one day work with BlackRock. Some people might say no. I think there is a shred of possibility there. I really do. If BlackRock is looking for someone to do um, to do uh, infrastructures for them at some point, why not Stellar? They will find Stellar Delicious the same reason that they find uh, uh, Wisdom Tree. I mean, uh, the same reason that Franklin Templeton found Stellar Delicious, right? It's a possibility. Hey, I'm not trying to sway you this way or that. That's up to you what you decide. I'm just speaking my own mind as I read a little bit of this article. So let's read this little tip. It says, if you're familiar with cryptocurrency, you know the market is a place where one's fortune can swing at any second. Now, ex, uh, pro XRP lawyer John Deaton has, a, has made a notable prediction. Representing, just like I'm making a prediction, I'm, I'm making a prediction that there is a high possibility that BlackRock might get involved with Stellar at some point. I don't know. Maybe not. There's a lot of companies out there. There are, but there are few that are as reputable and well-known and as experienced as Stellar. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Not like we need it to happen, but it would be a nice little bonus. We'll see. We'll see. I'm just putting it out there. Why not? It says, representing a host of XRP token holders. Deaton focuses on BlackRock's investment strategies, specifically in the widely used cryptocurrency exchange Coinbase. It says, zooming in on Deaton's crystal ball, the prediction unfolds. BlackRock might be gearing up for a strategic move, increasing its stake in Coinbase as the preferred custodian for influential players like BlackRock, Grayscale, Wisdom Tree, Valkyrie. Coinbase stands on, my apologies, let me scroll down. Brink of a windfall if the SEC greenlight spot Bitcoin ETFs. Now, wait. If they increase their stake in, in Coinbase, one of the most prominent things that Coinbase offers is stable coins. USDC stable coin. That's Circle. Circle, what's the best way to move USDC? The cheapest way. Stellar. So, I mean, I'm just keeping that in mind. There's no guarantees in any of this, but I, I'm just something that, that I'm going to be keeping a sharp eye on over time. So now we're gonna move on here to this little uh, YouTube video here. If I so this here is a video that was uh, released by Stellar Development Foundation. They've been doing a lot of information dumps. I don't prefer that uh, because it makes it very difficult to sift through all of the information. A lot of these videos are 30 minutes a piece, but this one here is titled Joff Ramsayer, Sisyphus Heter Heterogeneous and Efficient Partial Auditing of Replicated State Machines. Now. What will catch your eye is uh, when you first look at this video, the thumbnail picture is a, are a bunch of banks, a bunch of banks. They continuously show in their 
uh, their diagrams and their examples, banks connecting to each other and things of that nature. But let me read this little piece here. It says, um, this is at three minutes and two seconds. I'm reading a transcript here. Um, there are lots of different ways uh, to architect these systems. It says, um, do you think you can think about centralized or decentralized? You see that? It says, and in fact, in some of these, and for example, a central bank digital currency, there might only be, there might only be one replica. And then in fact, in some CBDC prototypes, the full ledger might not be public. This is very interesting. This is posted by Stellar. Very interesting. So are we talking closed ecosystem? Obviously we are, right? It's a rhetorical question. So in a closed ecosystem built on Stellar, let's say they decide to go with using the native protocol, which is the best way, right? They may not, they may not. But either way, Exilum has to be used for any any transactions that happen on Stellar and any wallets that are built on Stellar, correct? You have to have a modicum of lumens. But let's say that they, they use Stellar protocol outright, like something akin to what IBM was doing, right? Wouldn't that Stellar have to go into that closed ecosystem and remain there? It would not be coming out, right? So now we're going to move on to a little bit of Chainlink news. This article was titled Chainlink's new staking program draws nearly $140 million in deposits. The newest iteration of Chainlink's program expands its staking pool to $45 million, roughly 8% of the token's circulating supply. Chainlink, they are uh, very, very much motivated to become a, um, a top coin. You know, they're already very well known, but I mean... They've been making a lot of great moves, in my humble opinion. It says this. Chainlink, the largest Oracle provider connecting blockchains to real world data, rolled out the newest version of its staking program Tuesday afternoon and drew more than one hundred and forty million dollars in deposits in the first six hours. The quote V zero point two unquote mechanism increases the staking pool size to 45 million link, more than 8% uh, of the token circulating supply, and aims to increase the accessibility of staking according to the project's blog post, with stakers migrating to the new version to secure the protocol and claim rewards, Chainlink has sunset is, is quote, V0.1, unquote, program. The newest iteration comes one year after the blockchain data provider first introduced staking of its native link token. Since then, the institutional adoption of, of chain link services, as well as other technical upgrades aimed at increasing uh, user efficiency, reducing costs has grown. In October, Chainlink uh, introduced, quote, data streams, unquote, which aims to decrease the time for data to travel to its end destination. At the end of August, Swift, an interbank messaging system that facilitates cross-border payments, announced the success of its experiments with Chainlink in transferring tokenized assets across several private and public blockchains. According to Chainlink, staking landing pays the, quote, the V0.2 staking reward rate for community stakers is variable and depends on the total amount of link staked in the pool. So this is a pretty, pretty good occurrence here. Um, very, very interesting. I continue to be bullish on the chain, chain link. So let's move on here. So now we have to keep up with, well, we don't have to, right? But I think it's wise to keep up what's going on with the U.S. Treasury, uh, T-bills, bonds, etc., this article here is titled The Bond Market Hints at More Pain to Come for the U.S. Dollar. Yes, yes, yes. The dollar looked weak. Last I saw it, I think it was either early this morning or yesterday. It was at 102 on the DXY. Anybody else see that? What is it right now? I'm not sure. Um, but it says here, 10-year treasury yields break below key technical level. We'll see if it remains there, but this is pretty good. So Fed Governor Waller hinted at a potential policy pivot yesterday, and that was enough for traders to run with it. After having long hoped to hear the, those words come out, come out from the mouths 
of policymakers. In turn, the bond market saw a notable development with the 10 year Treasury yields falling past the 100 day moving average. And the drop is continuing today. Yes, that's what I want to hear. It says that is a massive technical level that is being reached and sets the tone for lower yields, which means more capital can play, buddy. It says with a potential look towards 4% next. That is still some ways to go after the near 70 BPS drop in the last month. And there is an argument that perhaps with four rate cuts priced in for next year, we have perhaps run up against the curb in angling for the Fed's policy pivot. Nonetheless, the technical sign above is not a good one. If you're a bond, you're a bond sellers as buyers are showing up to prove that the drop from 5% yields is not a fluke. Uh, not a fluke retracement of sorts. There you have it, folks. OK. All right. Let's move on here. So a little bit of U.S. Treasury news again. Now, this one I'm keeping my eye on and I'll tell you why. So this article is titled U.S. Treasury campaigning for amplified powers to chase crypto overseas. Now, when they say that, the first thing I think about is what Kathy uh, Wood said from ARK Invest about the great possibility of Gary Gensler positioning positioning himself to, at some point in the future, make a run at taking over the U.S. Treasury. He will leave that position at the SEC and try to go for the top position as U.S. as the U.S. Treasury. Um, that would be very bad. But if that were the case, and I know all of them sort of are on, they, they play the phone game and, you know, they position themselves according to who they think is going to be next. I hope this is not the case, but um, that this could definitely, you know, lend some credence to that. I would not want to see this, but let's read this little tidbit here. It says a top official has asked members of Congress for new laws to extend the Treasury's crypto reach beyond its existing enforcement and sanctions abilities. Wow. Just I mean, they just want more and more and more power, which shows that you're um, that they are not good at their jobs. Right. They're not competent. Because they have more than enough to do their jobs. They're saying we can't do our job. We need a little bit more. How much do you need? It's getting ridiculous at this point. But let's keep going. It says the U.S. Department of Treasury is pressing lawmakers for a new set of powers that would give the government unprecedented enforcement and sanctions authority over the crypto sector, including the ability to roam well beyond American borders and get involved with sanction with transactions that don't involve its citizenry what whoa I, I, and you know it's crazy a lot of other places will allow this to happen deputy secretary of the treasury wally adeyemo has lobbied senior members of congressional of, of congress with a proposal mapped out in writing that he called quote a set of common sense recommendations to expand our authorities and broaden our tools and resources to go after illicit actors in the digital asset space unquote according to excerpts from a speech he said to deliver on wednesday in washington well we'll see how that goes folks let's uh <laughs> let's end off with some good news here a little bit of silver and a little bit of gold. So now this article here is titled when silver breaks out, the move will be quite significant. I agree with that. I agree for, agree with that. And I hope so. My silver, I want my silver to go insane. So it begins here. It says the silver price is range bound at $23 an ounce, but that doesn't dissuade George Pospolis president and CEO of Mag Silver. In mid-November, Pasapalis spoke to Kitco at the 2023 Precious Metal Summit Zurich event. He said the lack of price movement is puzzling. No, it's not puzzling to me. Uh, however, is is very suppressed, just like XRP and a lot of other things. It says movement is puzzling given that demand is outpacing supply, something we've been talking about all year. Last year, there was a market deficit of 238 million ounces. That now you see why it doesn't make sense. Price should be way up. So it's quote, you can have increasing demand outstripping supply, unquote, said Paspalis. Quote, inventory inventory is falling by 50 percent. 
I can't wait for my silver to go go crazy. I I can't. I, I wanted to just skyrocket just because I, I want to really, really stick it to the industry. It says, and the price doesn't move. At some point in time, silver will break out. And I think it will be quite significant, unquote, he said. Mag Silver's primary asset is the Juanacipio mine in Mexico, which started concrete, uh, oh, which was started uh, concentrate production and shipped its first commercial lead and zinc concentrates in March 2023. The Juanacipio uh, processing facility achieved nameplate capacity during September with silver recovery consistently above 88 percent an important milestone was free flow free uh cash flow okay so that part we don't need to know about it says mag silver recently put in place a 40 a 40 million dollar senior secured revolving credit facility leading kit coach paul harris to ask about the future plans all right well all we really need to know is this individual is very bullish on silver they made some very good points It says, quote, I hope 2024 is major discovery for Mag Silver while also building cash on the balance sheet, unquote. He concluded, OK, so hopefully everything continues to go well and silver will break out at some point in the very near future. Let's end off here with a little bit of gold news. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this article is titled Gold Prices See Some Limited Selling Pressure As U.S. GDP Grew. All right, let's find out what's going on. The, the gold prices have lost some ground from its overnight highs above $2,050 an ounce as the market reacts to stronger than expected economic activity in the third quarter. Wednesday, the Bureau of Economic Analysis said the second print of third quarter GDP showed that the economy grew 5.2% between July and September, up from the previous estimate of 4.9%. Quote, the update primarily reflected upward revisions to non-residential fixed investment and state and local government spending that were partly offset by a downward revision to consumer spending, unquote, the report said. Activity was slightly stronger than expected as consensus forecasts were looking for an increase of 5%. The gold market is down from its overnight highs, but it is seeing some modest selling pressure in reaction to the positive economic data. December gold, gold futures last traded at $2,038.50 an ounce, roughly unchanged on the day. E economists note that it appears government spending drove economic growth in the third quarter, which is not ex uh, which is not expected to be a long term sustainable trend. I agree with that 100 percent quote increases in inventories and government spending explain the higher revisions to GDP. At some point when the government spending slows down, those gains will be reversed. But inventories are are less predictable, unquote, said Adam Button, chief currency strategist at Forex Live dot com. So. Now that you have that information, what are you going to do with it? If you haven't clicked that like button already, I would greatly appreciate it if you did. And until next time, everybody, let's get to the money.